In my previous video, I looked at how George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire uses magic differently than a lot of other fantasy series. The short version is that when you look at magic and fantasy worlds, there's a spectrum where on one end it's everyday and pseudoscientific, and on the other, rare and mystical, and that while most fantasy series nowadays tend to construct and treat their magic on the more pseudoscientific side, A Song of Ice and Fire is very much on the mystical side of the spectrum. After watching that video, you may have come away with the impression that I think that a mystical approach to magic is a superior way of writing your magic system. And that's fair. I do tend to prefer mystical magic systems to formalized ones, but there are cases where having a formalized mundane magic system isn't inherently a bad thing. There are things that you can do with a magic system like that that you can't do with a more mystical approach. To illustrate what I'm talking about, we're going to use the example of two of my favorite series. Naomi Novik's Temeraire series, and George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire, and we're going to look at their use of dragons, because everyone loves dragons. The premise of the Temeraire series is both simple and brilliant. What if the Napoleonic Wars were fought with dragons? What if every country had dragons as an air force? In Novik's alternate history, dragons are common and understood. They're bred for different traits like fire breathing and speed, divided into weight classes, crewed like ships with riflemen and spotters and captains, and sentient. That last part is important, because Novik takes the concept of dragons as an air force and uses it to explore and criticize colonialism. In Europe, dragons are treated like war horses and second-class citizens, while in the rest of the world, they're treated more liberally. The fantasy author N.K. Jemisin explains it really well in her review of the series. In Novik's world, partnership with dragons rather than dominance of human beings has become the deciding factor in the global economic and military competition. Thus, colonialism in this world has virtually failed since in partnership nations, dragons thrive, growing in number and specialization and serving as a formidable military presence in their own right, while in chattel nations, dragons are big but not much else. This levels the playing field between cultures which in our world became the victims of colonialism and the European powers. Where technology fails, dragons make the difference. Essentially, Novik takes technological development, animal husbandry is, after all, a type of technology, and ties it directly and tightly to social and cultural traditions in a way that simply doesn't exist in the real world. And that change completely disrupts the arc of history. In A Song of Ice and Fire, dragons are rarer than in Temer, with only three existing in the main narrative. And by scaling things back, Martin is able to put a single magical element in an otherwise mundane world to more clearly look at its impact. Dragons are cool, but in a world with wizards and dark lords, they're not special. But in a medieval world, a dragon is an elemental force of destruction, a flying nuke, a WMD able to wreak devastation while safe from counterattack. This is all a conscious decision on Martin's part. Here's a quote of his from a 2011 interview with Vulture.com. Dragons are the nuclear deterrent, and only Danny has them, which in some ways makes her the most powerful person in the world. But is that sufficient? These are the kinds of issues I'm trying to explore. The United States right now has the ability to destroy the world with our nuclear arsenal, but that doesn't mean we can achieve specific geopolitical goals. Power is more subtle than that. You can have the power to destroy, but it doesn't give you the power to reform, or improve, or build. The idea of unlimited destruction that doesn't give you unlimited power forms the core of Danny's storyline in A Dance of Dragons as her occupation of Marin begins to crumble from terror attacks and entrenched political pressure, but being able to cause vast swaths of destruction gives her no leverage over. This is a dynamic that just doesn't work if there are dragons flying around everywhere like in the Temer series. But by the same token, the kind of criticism of colonialism that Naomi Novik employs in the Temer series isn't possible if there are only three dragons in her world. And here's the thing. Both of these stories are equally interesting and equally worth telling. Now if you're a writer, how do you apply this to your own writing? Next time you're starting a story, try this. Whatever magic is in the story, try dialing it up to 11 and then dialing it down to 1. For example, the approach Martin took with dragons is not actually the lowest magic version he thought about having. I had written the first few chapters, and it's a, for fantasy, it's very realistic, it's very low magic. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had the Targaryens and they had dragons on their banners, but the question was, should they have actual dragons, or should it just be a heraldic symbol? And I was going back and forth about that. Um, until a friend of mine, a very talented fantasy writer herself, Phyllis Eisenstein, uh, read some of the early chapters and said, George, it's a fantasy. You have to have real dragons in it. I said, oh, gotta, of course you you're You gotta right. have dragons. He also mentioned in another interview that he thought about having the dragon motif come from a Targaryen ability for pyrokinesis. If we combine these options with Temeraire, we can see how a spectrum forms. On the low end, we have dragons as a symbol, then dragons as a pyrokinesis ability, dragons as nukes, and finally, dragons as an air force. 
Or for another example, moving away from dragons for a minute, in the previous video I went over how Martin takes the idea of a werewolf and makes it a little more mystical and plausibly deniable as non-magical. Let's work with that again. If you want werewolves in your story, you could dial the magic up to 11 and have it be a physical transformation. Or do like Martin and have it be a telepathic connection accessed in dreams. Or have the transformation be a mental one, with warriors entering a feral berserker rage. Or have the wolf transformation be entirely a metaphor, maybe a shift in identity in how a character sees themselves. And also consider how often it happens in your book. Does the transformation happen voluntarily every time the character enters battle? Or maybe it happens just once, a snapping character identity when they reach a breaking point, a thematically powerful moment. I tend to prefer stories with more rare and mystical magic systems. I feel like they're inherently more tied to character and story and drama, and those three are why we tell stories. But on the other hand, deconstructing and rendering mundane something that's usually held sacred can be really interesting and give you a lot to work with. Each point on the high to low magic spectrum has strengths and weaknesses, and the right one just depends on how well it suits the story you're trying to tell. And accentuating the story you're trying to tell is what having a magic system in a book is all about. Tamara's dragons are about criticizing colonialism. Martin's about exploring the power and limitations of violence. So experiment. Ask yourself on the magic spectrum, which point feels most interesting to explore? Which excites you more? Does a world rife with dragons used like airships make your imagination buzz more than another medieval European setting? Writing is a passion project, and the more excitement you feel for an idea, the more likely it will actually get written as a story. Which makes the impact and effect of your magic system clearer? The magical element being in isolation or endemic? Interacting with the normal world or a world awash in magic? The nuke or the air force? Which creates more conflict for your characters? Which forces your characters to make harder decisions? Conflict is the heart of fiction, and decision defines character. Do you want your character to have to face the temptation to wash away everything they hate in flame, like in A Song of Ice and Fire, or be forced to confront the ugly side of the country they love, like in Tamer? Are you trying to deconstruct or reconstruct an element of the world? Are you taking a trope and subverting it or reinstating its gravitas? Are you criticizing or agreeing with it? Are dragons dangerous and otherworldly, or a consequence of culture? Which better explores the theme you're examining? Which makes it more complex or gives it implications that make it more nuanced and resonate more with the reader? Too often in fiction, as writers, we just default to what everybody else is doing in our genre. Right now, that means the majority of books have a formalized and understood magic system. And sometimes that fits a story, and sometimes it doesn't. If you're a writer, experiment. And even if you do end up with a more common and formalized magic system afterwards, your story will be stronger for having it be a deliberate decision rather than something you just defaulted to. Thanks for listening. If you liked this video, hit the thumbs up button. And if you really liked it and are interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button. Thanks everybody, and I'll see you next time.